Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 31st of January, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So first on the agenda here, we have a post from Vitalik with a quick reminder of what shared security means and why it is important. Now, this is a, a bit of a lengthy post. Oh, not, not too lengthy, but I suggest going and reading it for yourself if you want to kind of like get the gist of it. But I, what I wanted to focus on was kind of like this table that he put together here. And I mean, the TLDR of this post is basically looking at the different security properties of independent layer ones, layer two, side chains, all that sort of stuff. And this goes back to what I was talking about actually last week on um, the Bankless live stream that I did with David about bridges and what I've been talking about a lot on the refill lately around bridges and how kind of like your assets are only as secure as where they're issued and stuff like that. So you can see here some examples. So if the asset is issued on Ethereum and you are using that asset on Ethereum, then the security level is high because you have Ethereum's security level. You have the miners securing the network, you have Ethereum uh, layer one's decentralization and in the future you will have the, the, the stakers and validators um, securing the network there. Another example is, you know, your asset is on Avalanche. This is an example I used last week. Um, and you are using that asset on Ethereum. Uh, the, the security is is low. So if you've bridged an asset from Avalanche over to Ethereum, then as I explained last week with these bridges, it's basically just an IOU because the asset was originally issued on Avalanche. So you really are, are at the kind of mercy of the Avalanche validators and the Avalanche network. not you don't, you don't have the Ethereum security for those assets because um, they're not issued natively on Ethereum. And they're, you know, they're kind of like, um, the difference is here between other layer ones and, and layer twos, as you guys know, is that with layer twos, they don't have their own validators. They don't have their own consensus, uh, their own kind of like validators that come to consensus on things and their own security, they rely on Ethereum for that. So if the asset is issued on Optimism, for example, and you are using that asset on Ethereum, then your security level is still high because of the fact that they're, uh, it's a, it's a roll up, right? That's, that's kind of like the security properties that we like. So I thought this was a really great and timely post because I've been seeing a bit of, um, I guess, FUD coming from uh, some kind of people in the industry about rollups and trying to redefine what layer one and layer two mean and what rollups means. And it's all pretty much like lies and misinformation. It's actually pretty bad. I'm uh, I'm pretty disappointed to see the things coming out of people, uh, especially from the Avalanche ecosystem, both Emin and Kevin, who I, I know Emin's a founder. I'm not, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if Kevin's a founder of Avalanche, but uh, they're spreading some pretty bad misinformation right now about layer twos, rollups and layer ones and things like that. So I thought these blocks post from Vitalik was very timely uh, and it's very, very accurate. It's uh, it's basically the, the industry standard agreed upon definitions of these things and it it basically fits in with the objective kind of reality of this sort of stuff. So I just wanted to kind of like highlight that there, but definitely recommend giving this, this post a read as it's very important and it's, uh, it's very straightforward. It's not too technical. Uh, it's actually not really technical at all. I think by now, pretty much all of you guys listening to the refill should understand what, what, what Vitalik is saying in this post. If you've been watching and listening for quite a while, as I've talked about this a lot as well and tried to explain it as best I can. Um, but Vitalik putting it down on, on paper, I guess, so to speak, is, uh, is a really great way to visualize it as well. So a new all core devs update from Tim Biko over the weekend. So I did say to you guys, oh, okay, this isn't working. <laughs> I did say to you guys that I expected a, um, I guess like a, a recap of Kintsugi from, uh, okay, it's working now, from Danny Ryan. But I think, uh, I'm not sure if that's still coming or not. It may, it may or may not be, but there was a recap given in this all core devs update from from Tim Biko. Uh, Tim Biko. So some stuff about the Kintsugi merge testnet here, some more stuff uh, around Shanghai actually, which I actually did didn't realize that we were this far ahead at this point, but we, apparently we are. Shanghai is going to be the first hard fork network upgrade uh, after the merge goes through, and there's already a bunch of EIPs or, or, or um or features that people want to get into the network. And there's already work beginning on this in terms of kind of research and development. So I think uh, the the merge is basically at the point now where essentially just kind of like testing it, making sure everything's good. The spec seems to be nearing the part where it gets frozen. And, and by a frozen spec, it means that there's no more changes to be made. That's what, what's going to go in, in on mainnet. And it makes it much easier to kind of like develop around. But yeah, I was, I was really surprised to see sh the Shanghai updates included here. But this is great. I mean, this includes the... Um, 
UX improvements that people have been uh, screaming about, EIP 3074, and I've talked about that before. And I'm, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the EIP where essentially it bundles the transactions so you don't have to do a separate transaction for like an approve. If you're doing a swap, for, a swap of a new asset, you wouldn't have to approve that asset and then swap in two separate transactions. It would happen in one. Uh, EIP 4488, which reduces the call data costs, which would lower the cost of rollups by about 5X. I've covered that um, extensively on the, on the refill before and a bunch of other things as well. So very, very awesome to see that the Shanghai planning has already begun. Maybe we see it end of year. Maybe that's, uh, the, and maybe um, the withdrawals going to Shanghai because as you guys know, withdrawals uh, for stakers isn't going through with the merge. It's coming about six months later. So maybe we see that in the Shanghai hard fork slash network upgrade. So very, very excited to see that. But I recommend giving this uh, core devs update a read. I'll link it in the YouTube description because uh, it's got a bunch of links to a bunch of other things that you can read as well. So Mike here had a really great uh, little, I guess, thread about rollups and and kind of like L1s and L2s and how they scale and, and visualized it with uh, the bus visualization that I've used before here. So you can see on the left-hand side of this image, transacting on L1 is essentially a bunch of, you know, individual cars and a bunch of people. Um, and, and those are the amount of people that you fit into those cars. You can see how much of the road space it takes up. Then on the right-hand side, you have like the same amount of people, but you have a bus. And then this is transacting on rollups where we can basically pack more transactions into to, um, into a roll-up than we can on L1 and kind of like make better use of that L1 space. So it, essentially making better use of the road, as you can see in this in this image here. Now, this is a very, uh, I mean, I always like this analogy, but it obviously misses a lot of stuff. Like obviously scaling via layer twos is going to give you much more capacity than a bus that does on the road. Like, you know, in reality, uh, th th this amount of people using using the bus here, I mean, the amount of road that they would be using is very minimal compared to how much rollups are going to scale. And that's what people like using the vertical analogy of kind of like um, skyscrapers. So basically building the sk skyscraper up as much as possible. And then on each level of that site, skyscraper, you can have like, you know, as many people as you, you know, I mean, a lot of people, not as many as you want, obviously it's not unlimited, but many, many, many people there. And then uh, the horizontal scaling with sharding basically lets you build more skyscrapers, right? It gives you more, I guess, like land to build more skyscrapers on. So people prefer that analogy, but I've always liked this because what I always like to do when I look for analogies is try to try to think like it does is this going to resonate with people that have absolutely no context around kind of like L2s like they've got basic understanding of blockchains they understand transactions they understand why uh you know it can't be unlimited scale because the 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 essentially the size that we have to fit transactions into is, is smaller, but then when explaining kind of like, okay, well, we're scaling via this thing called layer two, it essentially packs more transactions in to this thing, uh, where I guess in the ZK rollup, uh, in, in, in the ZK rollup sense into, into the proofs, um, and then in the optimistic rollup sense, I mean, it's, it, you can already go off on like a really big tangent here describing rollups, but essentially you get more bang for your buck of the, of the Ethereum block space, right? We're basically condensing those transactions, exactly what happens in a kind of analogy like this, where you're basically condensing all these people out of their kind of like, own cars into a bus and you get a lot more bang for your buck in terms of kind of like road space and things like that. So I thought that was a really cool thread. Definitely go give this thread a, a read. It's, it's a short thread. It's got a bunch of kind of like explanations about this sort of stuff. Um, so so yeah, great, great thread here, Mike. I know you're active in the Discord channel. It's actually where I saw this thread. Um, so yeah, great, great work here. I hope you keep doing more of these. So Rainbow Wallet uh, put out a tweet over the weekend that I wrote today's newsletter about where they said, Rainbow supports cheaper networks like Polygon, Optimism, and Arbitrum out of the box without any need for manual configuration. They just work. And all of your tokens appear without needing to switch networks. Now, this may seem like something small, but I think this is an absolutely massive UX upgrade from what we're used to. Think about what you have to do with MetaMask when you switch networks, when you add a new network, right? To add a new network manually in MetaMask, there's all this new terminology that, that you'll see that uh, we should never show the end user. Stuff like chain ID and RPC URL and block explorer URL. I'm sorry, but like that sort of stuff should never be shown to the kind of like a regular user. That that sort of stuff is power user stuff. Like even even that, because of the fact is this that's like showing users the IPv4 settings and saying, hey, input your IP here or input your, D, you, you know, your, your DNS. Yes, you can do that, but most users should never have to do that. It should just work out of the box. That is the secret to mass adoption. And that's exactly what Rainbow has done here. It just works out of the box. You don't have to add your, you, the, you don't have to add the networks manually. You don't have to just kind of like 
switch them or anything. It's just all in the background and all working uh, working nicely there. And they also have a little little logo on the um, on the asset to tell you what network it's on. Like I actually sometimes find myself. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I used to. I think you know Zappa does this too, where they put the little logo there. But it used to be kind of like I didn't know where all my assets were, and I had to kind of manually go to a block explorer and find them. That is not. Any ever going to be a thing that most people do and should, they shouldn't have to do that. It's a, it's a pain in the ass. So just having that logo there tells people, okay, well, you know, you have ETH here, you have ETH here, you have, you know, in this case, Matic on Polygon, right? And it just makes it much easier for people to kind of like get a quick glance of where their assets are uh, and kind of like, so that, you know, I mean, they're also going to like have a heart attack if they don't see their assets in like their Ethereum L1 wallet where they forgot that they bridged them to like Arbitrum or something like that, right? So there's also that aspect to it as well. So I just wanted to, to kind of like pick on that. There's a, the Daily Gray newsletter today um, is actually, uh, has a bit more about this. And I talked about how like Web2 has optimized for clicks and, and you know, the shortest amount of clicks possible and stuff like that. So I definitely recommend giving that a read if you want more context around this and more details around this. So Hashflow is now live on Polygon. So you can take advantage of the low transaction fees on Polygon to slap to trade with zero slippage and no MEV exploits and earn the best yields without impermanent loss. So easy to get started trading. You just go to app.hashflow.com here. Very awesome to see them live on Polygon. Um, I think they're going to be going live on every EVM compatible network, uh, which means obviously Arbitrum, Optimism, and a, and a bunch of the other kind of like alt L1s that are EVM compatible, which makes sense. I mean, this is how the EVM becomes like the standard and become and, and just increases its network effect and is actually bullish for like the basically Ethereum as a whole. Because think about it, the amount of entrenchment the EVM has means that all these EVM compatible rollups that we have, the Arbitrum and Optimism right now, ZK EVMs in the future, they're all just going to be immediately uh, populated with apps because the apps are already built in these sorts of things. They're already um, uh, they're already kind of uh, compatible with them, so there's no need to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, but at the same time, as I've said to you guys before, I'm very very bullish on uh, efforts being made by other by kind of like a layer two teams uh, doing something other than the EVM. Obviously, Starkware is very big there with Cairo and stuff like that and StarkX, and there'll be others, but uh, you can't deny the EVM's network effect at this point, the EVM's moat. It's just, it's really, really big. It's only getting bigger, and, you know, as if people, as much as people think the EVM is inferior technology, uh, it doesn't matter, right? It's, it's what works. It's what everyone's familiar with. It's what the app developers are familiar with, It's uh, and it's basically what keeps getting network effect as, as time goes on. So, little little tangent there, but definitely go check out this and check out Hashflow on, on Polygon if you're a regular user on the, on the POS chain there. So Empra on Twitter put out a blog post over the weekend, I think it was, um, titled A List of Open Problems in DeFi. Now, I spoke last week about you know, after the Frog Nation fallout about how I think that a lot of what we're seeing right now in quote unquote DeFi isn't actually DeFi or finance. It's like Ponzi games or money games. And because of that, people are kind of like misattributing things and saying, okay, well, this is a problem in DeFi, this needs to be solved. And it's like, well, if it's a Ponzi or if it's reliant on kind of like fresh money coming in for it to actually work and it only works in bull markets, well, that's a fundamental underlying issue. That's not a, a, like a problem that needs to be solved. That's a fundamental issue that may not even have a solution, right? Whereas the problems in DeFi that I think of immediately that immediately come to mind are things like re relying too much on centralized front ends, right? Admin keys, multi-sigs, having uh, having systems that basically are too interconnected with each other. That uh, one you know one little one cog in the system is too weak, and if that breaks, everything breaks. Like that, those sorts of things. Um, but in this po blog post, Emperor put together a very very comprehensive list of open problems within DeFi that I think is a highly recommended read. Some things around kind of like risk management um, and risk scoring on lending borrowing pools, which is something that a lot of users don't think about, but is extremely important for the protocols to think about. Uh, a bunch of other things around here around derivatives, which can get out of hand as well. Reputation systems, oracles. You know, oracles are a big thing that power all of DeFi and they carry a lot of risk with them as well. So I definitely recommend giving this post a read for more context around 
around uh, open problems in DeFi. But these are the things that I think can be fixed with, um, in one way or another. The things that I don't think can be fixed, as I said, are the, fundam are the products that are fundamentally built around the fact that they need new capital entering all the time to even work. And once that capital kind of dries up, they fall apart completely. And of course, I'm talking about things like, um, uh, not, not so much Olympus. I think Olympus is making an honest attempt at trying to build something uh, that, that, that actually has long-term lasting value. But the forks, of it definitely aren't and all the forks have pretty much like dumped really really hard because the game was up the musical chairs this the, the 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 music stopped and there was literally one chair for like you know a thousand people so that i think that those are fundamental issues that aren't going to be fixed but even in still in saying that uh, I think that there are kind of like ways that these teams such as Olympus can kind of like work around this, find better mechanisms to put in place, uh, even if they have to re-architect things, and then it could be cool. But these open problems are different to that. Uh, once again, I, I, I have to stress the fact that just because something calls itself DeFi doesn't mean that it's actually DeFi or finance related. It just, it could just be, you know, saying that it's DeFi because it's just easy for, the, for them to market themselves as that. Uh, a lot of these things are Ponzi's. A lot of these things are money games. A lot of these things are not going to be the future of finance, right? <laughs> Definitely not even the future of France. They're just going to, a lot of them are going to not, I mean, nothing goes to zero, but a lot of them are going to lose a lot of people money because they think that it's DeFi when in reality it's not. But anyway. Uh, are done with the rant there. On to the next update from Joey here, who announced Tribe Turbo, Turbo over the weekend, which is a new DeFi prim primitive which allows any token to become productive and provide fail liquidity at no cost to the markets that need it most. How is this possible, you ask? Well, Joey has a thread here. Now, this is innovation in DeFi. This is stuff that people have kind of like talked about with regards to DeFi 2.0. And, you know, as I've said to you guys before, I think the DeFi 2.0 branding is just kind of uh, just that's like marketing, right? It's just like kind of a meme. I think that there's plenty of innovation going on within DeFi and the protocols that people refer to as DeFi 1.0 that uh, there's no use kind of like separating them anymore. It's just DeFi to me. And there's no DeFi 3.0 or DeFi 4.0. It's just DeFi, guys, and we're improving it as time goes on and that's exactly what uh what joey's doing here with Faye protocol uh by uh, with uh, with tribe turbo joey and of course his team in the community as well um i definitely recommend giving this thread a read for a uh, a breakdown of exactly what's going on here what what's happening you know when to expect it stuff like that uh because it's very very interesting so i'll link that in the youtube description for you guys so Joseph DeLong actually teased this over the weekend. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out here. There is a new protocol coming called Astaria. And I have no idea what it does. I don't think there's any information about it. They have one tweet um, saying we are all on borrowed time. And people were kind of, I think, focusing on the, the the word time here and thinking it was reference to the Wonderland project. And it was kind of like going to be another... Um, Another uh, Olympus fork, another Om fork. I don't know. All I know is that Joseph DeLong's involved, who was the former CTO of SushiSwap. And before that, he was working on ETH2 stuff. Very, very smart guy. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what this is. But I thought I'd put it on you, your guys' radar because I usually try to point out projects when they're really early on in their life cycle uh, for, for you guys so you guys can get, can get on board with it and be kind of like early to it. Because at the end of the day, I think the biggest, maybe the, not the biggest, the most powerful alpha in this ecosystem is just being early to things that succeed. Now, obviously, being early to um, to some things is not going to get you anywhere. A lot of projects don't actually succeed. A lot of projects may just have a pump and dump where their token goes up really quickly, then comes back down really quickly. But if you catch that, just you know, one that you're really early to, you get in really early, maybe you you know, you know get like a healthy airdrop for being early or you invest early on when no one else is paying attention to it or you be, become part of the team, become part of the community and you get rewarded for that. That is how I've seen a lot of people or pretty much everyone make their fortunes in crypto. I mean, all of my friends are hardcore Ethereum people. We kind of like, you know, went through the bear market together, all that sort of stuff. We were relatively early to ETH and that's kind of like where how we kind of like got to where we are. Um, and also DeFi, the, you know, DeFi summer in 2020. That's the same the same, same kind of story there. There are a lot of people who were very early to NFTs and saw what was coming and made the right bets and have kind of like ridden that wave up. So you can be, uh, I mean, you could be early, you can, uh, but, but being late is very easy too, because you can think that you're early in terms of kind of like uh, the cycle, because you got to look at it from like a in crypto cycle and then like an out of crypto cycle. There's the in crypto cycles that happen pretty regularly where things can get out of control and then come back down. But you're still early if you kind of like take the out of crypto cycle into account, which is a much longer term cycle. So let, maybe I'm confusing you guys for, uh, here, but let me just use an example. 
the way I think about it is ETH went to $1,400 in 2017, then went back to $80 by the end of 2018. That was an in crypto cycle. ETH went from, I guess, what was it? 30 cents in 2015 to now two and a half or I guess whatever it is, $2,600 right now. Um, that is a, a kind of like an out of, crypto, out of crypto cycle because that is pretty much because uh, we're not at obviously at all time high. We're not in like the 4000s or anything like that. But the price that ETH is now, most of its life hasn't been at this price. And as time goes on, as Ethereum becomes more successful, the, obviously the earlier you were, the more, more kind of like return you would have had. But the thing is, is that you can't just look at like the microcosm of 2017 and 2018 and, and, and the rest of the bear market. You have to kind of like look at the long term, the macro sense, if you want to look at the out of crypto cycle. And I guess maybe that's the wrong terminology to use or maybe confusing terminology. Out of crypto just basically means that, you know, you, if you expect more and more people to come into this industry, to invest in this industry, uh, then uh, over time, the assets that you hold or the projects that you're backing if they're good, should do well. And the same was true for so many kind of projects. I, I use Aave as an example, right? Aave, I think at the bottom of um, Aave's price, which was known as um, Lend uh, back in 2019, I think it bottomed out at like a $5 million market cap or something like that. Today, I think it's 2 or $3 billion in market cap. So, and, and that's after it kind of like pumped up in 2017 because I believe it was an ICO. But uh, you, got, you just got to look at the long term. I mean, this is just a roundabout way of me saying zoom out. But, it, you know, the depends on your time horizon as well. A lot of people don't want to have to, to hold on to something for 10 years to make a return. I mean, that's fine. Like you can go do whatever you want. Um, you know, if you want to make a lot of money within a few months, I mean, that's, it's not investing to me. It's kind of like speculating and gambling, but uh, that's the kind of like mindset a lot of people come into this industry with. And, you know, I always find it funny that when it, when it kind of like happens like that, because the most successful people that I know in this industry and the ones that have made the most money are the long-term investors. The short term, they may make some money in the, in the short term, but then they leave a lot on the table, right? It's like coming to a Coming to a, a table, uh, uh, eating really quickly, it's like a dinner table, or I guess like a, 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 um, an all-you-can-eat table, eating really quickly and then missing out on all the other food that, that, that is yet to come. It's the same with these short-term speculators that maybe hang around for three months. They come, they make a little bit of money really quickly, but then they miss out on all the money they could have made by being a long-term investor and they could have made you know potentially a lot more. So I think um, you know bringing it back to Astaria here, not to say that this is kind of going to be a project that's going to kind of like, uh, it's going to get you to make it, <laughs> as they say, but just being early in general to projects like Astaria, uh, if they do succeed, um, I think is just kind of like the best way to do that, uh, to, to best way to make it in this industry. So definitely go follow the account and keep an eye on it. Uh, I'm very curious to see what this project is. So the first lecture from Tim Roughgarden called the Foundations of, for, for, from his Foundations of Blockchain uh, lecture series is now available on YouTube. So I think it's only a uh, 10 minute video or at least kind of like the first first video is, is, is 10 minutes here. But as I've mentioned before, I'm pretty sure I mentioned this on Refuel, Tim Roughgarden, who is a professor at, at uh, Columbia University and also worked on yeah, P1559 and did a kind of like research paper for it. He's now doing a fund Foundations of Blockchains lecture series on, on YouTube and it's completely free. So definitely go watch the first episode. I really, really in, uh, enjoyed kind of like watching it. It was it was pretty good, even for me, who obviously isn't a beginner. Uh, it's still good to go back to the basics and go back to the foundations of things. And there was actually one tweet in this thread that I really, really loved and really resonated with. And I think a lot of people are going to resonate with where Tim says, for us, blockchains will not be about digital money, except as a means to an end but rather a new computing paradigm, a programmable computer that lives in the sky that is not owned by anyone um, and that anyone can use. This is exactly kind of why I've been so interested in Ethereum over uh, and smart contract chains in general over something like Bitcoin. I don't think money or just digital money is the revolution here. I agree with Tim. The revolution is a new computing paradigm. If you just look at the money thing, you're kind of like getting maybe 10% of this industry, even less than that. But what I love about Ethereum is that it still has the money aspect to it. It still has a native asset tied to it. That native asset is not just an afterthought. It is part is a core part of the network. But the Ethereum network is so much more than ETH as an asset. It is obviously all of the apps running on top of it, no matter what it is, DeFi, NFTs, whatever. It's all of that sort of stuff. It's, I mean, it's it's even beyond that. It's like all the research that's going into all the bleeding edge cryptography. It's all the research going into bleeding edge computing stuff like rollups and and stuff like that, and all the privacy stuff we've got going on. I mean, it's so much more than just digital money, which, as Tim says, is just a means to an end. And I agree with that. 
But uh, that's not to say that digital money isn't interesting. It's just so much less interesting than the rest of what this industry has to offer. So I just really liked that, uh, that tweet here from Tim, but I'll link this in the YouTube description. You can go check it out for yourself. So uh, just a couple of final things here. L2Beat announced that they're going to be hosting a conference in Amsterdam called Layer 2 Amsterdam happening on April 19th and April 20th this year. And this is going to be happening around EF DevConnect here or DevConnect and also ETH Amsterdam as well. I am going to be at Amsterdam. I know I originally said I was going to be at Denver, but apparently, uh, apparently, but unfortunately, I'm not able to make it to Denver. I am going to try so hard to make it to Amsterdam. I really, really want to go. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going. I just like barring any kind of like things that stop me from going. Maybe I, at the moment, I don't think I can fly out unless I return a negative COVID test. So I think that's the only thing that would stop me from going is that if I return a positive COVID test before my flight, I won't be able to actually uh, go. Go. Um, but I'm planning to come and I'm planning to, to stay in Amsterdam for a couple of weeks as well. Definitely want to see what the um, what the city has to offer, but I'm super pumped for this. I'm pumped for like everything. I mean, DevConnect is, uh, is, is going to be focusing on the economics of Ethereum as well, I believe, which is super exciting because usually Ethereum conferences don't do that. Um, and then uh, obviously Layer 2 Amsterdam is going to be from L2Beat is going to be focusing on the Layer 2 ecosystem. And then ETH Amsterdam is going to be your classic hackathon, bunch of different talks from different people. And I'm sure there's going to be other side events happening during that kind of like one to maybe two week period there. So I'm Super looking forward to this. I hope to meet a lot of you in Amsterdam. I was hoping to meet a lot of you in Denver, but that's not happening. So Amsterdam in April is the next best thing here. Uh, but yeah, definitely go. I kind of check this out. I don't think there's a way to RSVP yet, but you should be following the L2 Beat account on Twitter anyway. Um, L2 Beat obviously is that website that tracks all the L2 metrics, L2Beat.com. I've talked about them a lot on the on the review before. So yeah, definitely go, uh, go check that all out. All right, finally here, I just wanted to give a quick shout out that, uh, uh, as you guys know, I'm an advisor to Polygon uh, and I was contacted for, uh, for by the team because they want some help recruiting someone to lead Dev, uh, DevRel or developer relations in the US. So if this sounds like you, if you think that you can do developer relations, I mean, if you don't know what that is, then then you probably can't do it, uh, especially you probably can't even, you, you obviously can't lead, <laughs> lead it. But if it sounds like you, if it's something that you are interested in doing, it's something that you've got experience in, uh, definitely DM me on Twitter. I'll, um, I'll get back to you within the next couple of days and I'll do an intro with the Polygon guys if you fit the bill. Um, and DM me with an intro of yourself. Don't just DM me and say, hey, I'm interested because I've got so many DMs to go through. So please just intro with uh, with why you think you're kind of, uh, I guess, like fit for the role. I think this is obviously an awesome role because of the fact that you'll be working with one of the bleeding edge kind of like Ethereum scaling solutions. Polygon's awesome. I mean, the team's awesome. I've worked with them as an advisor for over a year now. I have nothing but good things to say about them, of course. Um, but yeah, if this kind of like fits you, then definitely uh, DM me on Twitter with an intro. Uh, if I don't get back to you, uh, it's because I, I, it's either that I've, I've, um, I've got other people that have already kind of like been passed on or you didn't fit the bill. So don't take offense to it. Um, but still, don't be shy reaching out to me uh, on, on Twitter there. Now I have a, a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to make a, a quick comment about the markets. I know I've talked about the markets a bit too much lately. And I don't usually do it. But quick comment on the markets here. I... I'm really, I'm a little bit frustrated about kind of like what I saw play out on Twitter over the last few months, especially with all of these traders and rotators just shilling absolute garbage to everyone. I just want to, like, this isn't investment advice, but I just want to give a, a bit of like kind of life advice to you guys. I personally have never, uh, other than my first foray into crypto in 2013, I have never since I got back into crypto in 2017, looked at these people and said, oh, I want to buy this thing because this person shilled it to me. As I said to you guys before, if someone is shilling you something, especially a trader on Twitter, they've already packed their bags. They could have packed their bags, you know, ages ago, and like at a much cheaper price. What they're doing by shilling it to you, especially if they're a trader, they're looking to pump the price up so that they can have exit liquidity, so they can have a higher uh, price to exit at and sell. They're not going to tell you that they sold. They're never going to tell you that they sold. And there's plenty of these people who do this. And it really, really annoys me when this happens because I know people get hurt doing this. They buy into it, they get dumped on, and then they're kind of left holding the bag. Two weeks ago, everyone was memeing this thing, this acronym FOAN, which stands for Phantom uh, or FTM One uh, Adam and Nia, right? The 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 uh, the other kind of like quote unquote ETH killers or the L1 trade. Everyone was like, oh, we're going to rotate into these because these haven't pumped yet. 
Well, they rotated into it, right? It worked for a couple of days, then the market crashed. In two weeks, all of these things are down 50%. So you lost half your money if you bought at, uh, around the time that these people were kind of like shilling this stuff to you. So, and, and they probably sold, right? Uh, because they know what they're doing. Um, well, not all of them, but like a lot of them do. So just as an example there, I, I just, I get so frustrated when I see this because I know people are getting hurt. I know people are kind of losing money here. I think that as always, being a longer term investor, investing in things you actually believe in, unless you're a trader, if you're a trader, you can do what you want. But if you're an investor, you shouldn't be following what traders are doing. Because if you're planning to invest in something and hold it for the long term, by listening to a trader, you're, 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 you're diametrically opposed. A trader's position is dictated by days, weeks, and sometimes months. A long term investor's position is usually dictated by years. So you're literally playing a different game. So I just wanted to kind of like give a bit of um, a heads up there for you guys because I've seen people kind of like just, uh, it's just been a mess lately. I've seen a few people kind of like really lose some money jumping into this sort of stuff. So I just figured I'd bring that up. But anyway, I'm going to leave it there for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.